Um, let's just uh, take a second to pray, and we'll get into the word this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, the opportunity to be here again, and, and just I pray that the, the word that I speak would be helpful, instructive, and that people in this room would just be encountered by, by who you are, Jesus. That you turn the water into wine. What does that mean? What's that all about? And would you please give us insight to that? In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So during one weekend in October, just kind of getting a sense of my space here a little bit. All right, cool. Uh, during one weekend in October last year, 2018, there was an auction in New York, a Sotheby's auction. And there, at that auction was sold the most expensive bottle of wine ever. Now this bottle of wine was a 1945 Romanet Conti Burgundy Red from Cote de Nuit. I know everyone knows exactly what that is. <laughs> but it was a really good wine, right? So it sold for a record price of $558,000. Half a million dollars for a bottle, 750 milliliters of wine. And so according to this article from Food and Wine, Romane Conti is a renowned producer to this day. And the reason that this bottle of wine was so significant was because that there was only about 600 bottles ever produced ever before they tore out those vines and replaced them. And the, the head of Sotheby's International Wine Department, he described their wine as rare and wonderful. It is, it is so concentrated and exotic with seemingly everlasting power. A wine at peace with itself. Wow. I'll pay a half million dollars for that, right? But I'm not, a, now I'm, not, I'm not a wine connoisseur, as you may have surmised at this point. But there's a couple things I would probably buy first before I dropped half a million bucks on a bottle of wine. Now that money, that could, have, that could buy a lot. And that certainly could have bought a lot at this wedding in this story. Could have bought enough wine before they ran out. But as it was, the groom had didn't have enough, and this, no matter what had happened, it was a problem. See, what you need to recognize is that in this culture, in this day, they were, the weddings were not like our weddings. Our weddings are planned months in advance, happens in 12-hour periods, ceremony, pictures, reception, boom, tight 12-hour period or less, right? In Jesus' day, weddings and the reception lasted up to seven full days. And so you needed to put out, if you were the groom, you were expected, all right, buddy, let's get the wine served. Provide for your guests. And this was kind of like the dowry. This is what the expectation was at the culture at that time. And there is some evidence that they have, the, the bride's family may have been liable to sue if they did not provide the wine needed for this party. And of course, it was also a shame culture. So there was some shaming involved as well. So it was not a good thing for this guy to want, run out of wine at his own wedding. So regardless of how it happened, way too early into this wedding, the wine has run completely dry. There's no more, and everyone in the know is freaking out. No one has any idea what to do about this problem. But everyone else knows, hey, the party's good, music's good, the DJ is fantastic, the band is awesome, you know, we're, it's popping, all right, let's do this. We're catching up with our friends, we're having a good time, this is fantastic, I love this wedding. And then they go to the cash bar, and they're like, oh, I'm so sorry, sir, we, had, we just ran out of wine, just for a second, they went to the back, they're gonna need some more, just a couple minutes. And of course, secretly, the waitstaff person, he knows exactly that that is a complete lie. There is no more wine, what are they going to do? So apparently, one of the people in the know was Jesus' mom. And his mother, you know, he's, he's been in the family, he's a firstborn son, he, uh, has been really much, very much the provider since Joseph passed away. And so he's a resourceful guy. He could probably figure this out. All the people tell Jesus what's going on. And so she goes, she goes to Jesus. She kind of you know, wants to keep it on the DL. So she, he, she leans down, whispers in his ear, "They don't have any more wine." Innocuous statement, innocent statement, just informing. Not apparently so in Jesus's mind. Right? Because what does Jesus say? He says, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. So Jesus, he's like, he like almost puts his hands up. He's like, can I take a couple steps back? And I would if I could. But he takes a couple steps back. He's just like, I, I can't have anything to do with this. 
this is a really significant thing you're asking. Whoa, put on the brakes, Mary. And to us, it's a little bit shocking to hear Jesus talk like this because if you have any image of Jesus in your mind, it's either him crucified or him holding like a lamb, right? There's always like kind of that, that, that dichotomy of two pictures of Jesus Christ. And so why does Jesus respond like this? Because if there's a question you probably have in your mind, you're like, dude, cool it. No, I'm just asking you a question, right? Like, why does he respond this way? So in the Gospel of John, actually, this, this response of Christ is not uh, unusual. It's actually pretty common because people all over the gospel, they'll come to him with a seeming innocuous statement, a seeming innocent thing to say or ask of Christ. And he responds in a very different way, like he's kind of in another realm, sort of, and he is speaking from that place based on what they've said. And you're kind of confused. But the reason is this, because we have to recognize that for Jesus, he's the only one in the room who actually knows what's really going on. Everyone else, they think they know what's happening. They think they won't know what is going on in the room. But Jesus, he recognizes the symbolic and import, the gravitas of this moment. He recognizes that Mary's words are propelling him into something significant. That the room, the wedding, the wine, the lack of it, everything... <coughs> It points to something about him, that if he performs this sign, it says something about him. And that's why John says in verse 11 that this act was the first of his signs, where he manifested his glory. And so this miracle is not like a fun party trick. It's not that he did it even out of compassion for the man, even though that certainly it was, certainly was compassionate of him to do this. The reason he did this was because of the weight of the moment, that there was something in this moment that was going to communicate something about him. And so imagine Mary, probably a little stunned, right, kind of taken aback a little bit, maybe about to tell him, yeah, young man, how dare you talk to me like this? But then he just kind of gives her a look. Right? They share a knowing look. And she knows immediately he has something planned. And so she turns to the wait staff, do whatever he tells you. And so they leave the tombs, they leave the party, they leave the dancing, leave the conversation, they go off into a corner room, away from everything, away from everybody. And in this room, there's a bunch of different stuff, but there are these six stone water pots and these are massive babies like they're 20 to 30 gallons big and he looks at these ceremonial water pots used for religious washing rites for the Jews and he turns to the waste tap, he says fill these up with water to the brim and if you're these wait staff, you probably you gotta wonder what's going through their minds, right? Because they're just they're told by Mary, probably one of the people who are in the know, they've been planning this wedding. Okay, she's sending Jesus, he probably has a plan. Maybe he's maybe he's gonna send the disciples to the corner store. I don't know, pick some wine. Uh, we have we have some plan. We 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 trust in this guy, and his response to the wineless wedding crisis of 30 AD is <laughs> fill up these pots with water. What are we supposed to do it? Just ladle it out and give it to people. Pretend it's wine. It's gonna be great. Like it's this is what are we doing? But putting them shoving their misgivings, they go and they get the wine out. Or they get the water into the jugs, fill it up. They're so full you could skim the water straight up the top of the knife. So the water pots are all filled up. He tells them to scoop the water out, bring it to your boss, see what he thinks. So given the fact that this is water, right? A little risky proposition for the wait staff, but they're going to scoop the water out, bring it to the, to the head waiter, and see what happens. Now, whether it was in the filling of the jugs or the transfer of the water into the, into the glass and then bring it to the guy, through, purely through willpower, Jesus has transformed this water into wine. Accelerating through the process of making wine, the planting, the sowing, the reaping, the crushing, the fermenting, the bottling, everything to make wine. Just rushes straight through it. And it wasn't like he made a glass. Look how cool this is. I made water into wine. Look at that. That's one, you know, eight ounces. He didn't make 750 milliliters. He didn't make a bottle. If you do the math, and do a little conversion, it's 900 bottles of wine, folks. 
based on the head waiter's reaction, this wasn't like barefoot or something. Like this was really good wine. Like this was excellent stuff. And so this was like our half a million dollar bottle of Romanet Conti Burgundy Red. Like this was good stuff. And he had no idea where this, where he got this, but he turns uh, to the groom and he calls him over and says, hey, come here. This is weird. Everybody I've worked with, everyone, everyone serves the good wine first, standard practice, and then they bring out the bad wine after everyone's a little drunk and no one cares anymore. That's what people do. But you have brought out good wine, and now you've brought out even better wine. This isn't normal. And of course, as far as the groom knew, all the wine had disappeared, and he has been frantic up until this point, recognized the, the repercussions of what he might be facing, and all of a sudden, this the head caterer, the guy he hired, is holding this mysterious glass of red wine. Where did it come from? He don't know, but there is so much more where that came from. And it's through this sign, the water into wine at the wedding of Cana, that John says that Jesus manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. But perhaps the biggest question in your minds is this. What the heck are you going to do with 900 bottles of wine? What do you do with that? What does that mean? And so to answer that, there's actually a significant answer to this. So in the Old Testament, there were these people that God had appointed. They were called prophets. And they were kind of given a behind-the-curtain peek at what his plans, what his purposes were going to be in the future. And so one of these prophets, his name was Amos. And Amos gave a prophecy that went like this. talking about the day when, the, when God would send the Messiah, send the Savior, and he said, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. So Amos was predicting that when the Messiah came, there would be so much wine, it wouldn't even make sense to plant it anymore. I, he was predicting that when the Messiah came that there would be so much wine, it'd almost be like the mountains and the hills were just dripping with the stuff. That there would be an abundance of it. So Jesus makes wine flow at this feast because that is exactly what the Messiah was prophesied to do. It's like he's openly, openly declaring, I'm the Messiah, I'm the guy, this is me. And he offers a passing glimpse through this sign of what the world would be like after he accomplishes what he was sent to do. But that's not the only thing that this sign communicates. The symbolism of this sign is so heavy and significant. See, it's not only the wine, the quantity of it that's significant, but it's also the fact that they're at a marriage feast. Several times throughout the Gospels, Jesus refers to himself and others refer to him as the bridegroom. And so with that knowledge in our head, when the head waiter, he asks the bridegroom where the wine came from, we're invited by the weight of the story, the symbolism that's present in John's gospel. To kind of scratch our heads and think, who is the bridegroom that the head waiter's talking to? Really? A little double entendre, probably, meaning two people at, at once. So again, he says, you, O bridegroom, you've kept the best wine until now. You've served the good wine, and then usually the mediocre wine follows, but this piece is only getting better. So what this means is this. Jesus, the Messiah, he is the capstone to the entire biblical story. He is the person that everyone is talking about in the Bible. If Moses and the prophets, they were high-end, award-winning bottles of wine, then we have here in Jesus Christ... Romanet Conti, burgundy red, half a million dollar bottle of wine. God has saved the best for last in Jesus. And so as John says in the first chapter of his book, for the law was given through Moses, which is a good thing, excellent thing. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And that is even better. All of this, the whole story, all pregnant with meaning, the fact that it's at a wedding, the fact that he multiplies this wine to be so 
so abundant, the revelation of his glory, it all points to this hour that Jesus was talking about when he, when he spoke abruptly to his mother. This hour that said Jesus had not, that Jesus had said not, had not quite yet come. And this hour he's talking about is the hour of his death. And during that hour, he too would drink a cup of wine, but it wouldn't be a cup of celebration. So at the end of his ministry, during another feast, one with a much different atmosphere than the one at Cana, he would take a cup of wine and he would give it to his disciples and he would say to them, drink of it all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And that cup of grace and that cup of mercy, that was theirs to keep, to drink of as often as they met. And it's ours to keep as we celebrate the sacrament of communion. But that cup, it came at a great price. And it was greater price than the half a million dollar bottle of wine. It, it was more expensive than that. Because in order to give this cup of grace to us, He had to drink the cup of God's wrath. Now we as a people, we, we were empty. We, we feel empty a lot. And it's our sin that leads to that emptiness. And I don't know where you are at, but I know that I have been in some of these situations. So we feel justified. When someone hurts us, we are angry at them. We hold on to the bitterness that we feel. But at the end, doesn't that bitterness leave us joyless? empty we think maybe we'll drink our fill of lust and just sexual pleasure and just pursue that and that will fill us up and satisfy us but in the morning we just wake up with a just a pain in our heart maybe if we think we'll just we'll satisfy ourselves we'll be filled with the abundance of the world the things I'll, I'll climb the ladder at my business at my corporation. I'm going to climb up and be as successful as I can possibly be, get as big of a paycheck as I can possibly get, and get as much stuff as I can possibly acquire. But it seems like our covetousness and our greed is unsatisfied with anything we acquire. And it robs us every single time. Our sin leaves us empty and joyless. We're as empty and joyless as a, a wedding without any wine. And because of our sin, God was prepared to fill us with his judgment. He was prepared to make us drink the wine of his wrath. And as he was swirling that cup around, he was prepared to just drink it and tip it into our mouths. But instead, God gave the cup to Jesus. The abundance of the world's brokenness, the immensity of his sin, and God's terrible anger over all of it was given to Jesus to drink straight down to the bottom of the glass. So despite his anger, God so loved you that he sent his only son, Jesus, into this world so that he might drink the cup of wrath and spare you the experience so that you might only drink of his mercy and of his grace and of his love. Jesus, he tasted of that cup once and for all so that you could taste the cup of his mercy which never, ever runs dry. The wine of his grace that flows in abundance. The wine of his grace that flows down the mountains and the hills never ending. Always granting forgiveness. The wine like that, unlike the Romane Conti Burgundy Red is truly rare and wonderful. The wine that truly does have an everlasting power. And today you are invited into his marriage feast. The marriage feast of the bridegroom Jesus, which has no end, and into his love that never, ever runs out. And let me tell you what's needed to enter this feast. You don't need to clean yourself up before you enter into the feast. You don't need to bring any presents or gifts to enter in. You don't even need to be an especially religious person to attend. The only thing that is needful is this. Believe 
and trust in Jesus as Savior, as Messiah, as Lord, that he's here for you, that he offers forgiveness for you, that he offers grace for you, that he offers himself to you. And he will bring you what your heart has always longed for, satisfaction, fullness, and abundance, never ending. And if this is you today, and if this has been you, I say this, welcome to the party. Welcome to the party. It's a good one. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you so much for your abundance. That through the sign of the wedding of Cana, you provided a huge amount of wine. And you gave us so much more than we could ever ask or imagine. And God, you sent your son, Jesus, to die for us, to restore us to life, to give us fullness where we felt empty. And I pray, Lord, if that is anybody in this room today, if they feel an emptiness, they feel brokenness, if they feel just a lack in any regard, that you would speak to them, Lord, that you're here for them today, that you love them, you've called them, and you died for them, that they were worth it. Thank you, Lord, for your abundance and for your grace and your mercy. Amen. And now, as we move into the time, maybe by that prayer, maybe by anything I said in that message, that you are moved into an opportunity to reflect and engage with God right now. So that's what we're going to do. And what this is called is, con is confession. Confession is just kind of hitting the reset button. An opportunity to get off of your chest everything that you are dealing with everything that you are wrestling with, every sin that you have in your mind. And the, the point of this isn't to exhaustively feel, make you feel guilty or anything like that. It's to, it's to give freedom, to give, to give light and life. And so I just want to invite you to bow your heads, pray, do whatever you want to do when you pray, if you pray. And just give it all to the Lord. So let's take a couple seconds of silence. Give us, renew us, and lead us so that we might walk in your will and glorify your name. If you confess your sins today, I just want to speak this word of forgiveness. As the Holy Spirit has given to me this authority that as a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce to you that you are forgiven of all of your sins, no matter what they are, no matter how frequent they've been committed, no matter what. Your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 